是呃 Rust Core 的 Alex， 他今天会帮我们介绍 Rust 的呃的历史还有未来的展望。那呃我在为呃在前面呢有准备了一些就是贴纸，还有一些我叫 m a c b o x 的一些小礼物。那等一下呃有就是基本结束之后，大家可以来前面拿拿贴纸。感谢大家今天呃捧场，对，好，那呃我们就废话不多说，我们请 Alex 帮我们一下。
your program likely has a critical security vulnerability that can be incredibly devastating to whatever you're working on at the time. So given the fact that we have all these existing bugs in C and C++, why do they keep using C and C++? We're decades down the road and we're still developing software in C and C++. But it turns out there's some very real costs with moving away from C and C++, especially to a language like Rust, which is relatively new. One of the primary uh, costs of these is inertia, or just the cost of a rewrite itself, where you have these gargantuan code bases like MySQL or Postgres, and these, these massive projects would never be rewritten into Rust just overnight. So this is always going to happen piecemeal, and there's going to be very, various bugs introduced and kind of all that good stuff. So, this ends up being a pretty costly operation to move away from what you have already. And then also, kind of for the past few decades, if you have a new kind of chip, a new computer, a new platform, it's essentially defined by the fact that C and C++ will run on it, whereas Rust is relatively new and has a little bit to catch up in terms of the maximal amount of portability that uh, you'll find in C and C++. But there's also this sentiment that we've seen on the internet of, let's be honest, if you need segfault protection, you're a bad programmer. So this is kind of the embodiment of the idea that these memory safety bugs are just that. They're bugs. And obviously, good programmers don't write bugs. But let's actually be honest here. This is sort of a false dichotomy where this is preventing us from actually getting a lot of the, of the benefits of Rust. It happens to real-world developers in C and C++. So I want to walk through some examples of this. The first of which I want to talk about is OpenSSL. Um, what developers of OpenSSL bank for bad programmers? Clearly not. They've, developing, they've been developing an SSL library that's been the foundation of the internet for decades now. But recently, OpenSSL was hit with a vulnerability called Heartbleed. Now, Heartbleed was probably one of the most severe security vulnerabilities in the modern era. And if we take a look in detail about actually what happened here, it all boiled down to a missing bounds check somewhere inside of the C code. This bug introduced two, year, two years before it was found would allow you to look at various chunks of memory on the server and basically just read off the private key, compromising all future transactions of the SSL server. And so what this is really boiling down to is we have this massive code base in C for OpenSSL, and every single line is a candidate for being a memory safety vulnerability which very frequently can then translate to one of the worst security vulnerabilities of all time. But the theme here is that the OpenSSL programmers are not bad developers. They're simply humans. We all make mistakes. So another example of this is Android. So are the developers of Android bad, bad programmers? There was a vulnerability a few years ago called StageRight. This was in the media parsing library of Android, where essentially, if I sent you a text message, I could take over your phone. No interaction was needed, and I had complete access to everything that you had locally on your phone. Like the openness, or like the Hartley vulnerability, this was purely related to buffer overflows, to various uh, errors in C and C++, because this media parsing library working with all these untrusted sources of information was also written in a memory unsafe language, which had by default all these bugs you have to watch out for. And the list goes on here. We have the developers of Windows, which are clearly not bad programmers, but the Conficker worm was one of the worst viruses kind of happening in the early world. Well, move along, we find libraries like curl, which this is an HTTP library that runs from everything like your car to your phone to half the programs in your computer. And every year there's a stream of CVEs happening against this, uh, this kind of very, very large C and C++ code base simply because every single line is a candidate for these problems, and naturally they're going to happen accidentally. And you might think, well, these are all kind of high-level libraries, but even the core foundation of every single program on Linux, GLibc, is still hit with these memory safety vulnerabilities, these CVEs, and so this was a recent vulnerability where a malicious DNS packet could take over your program once you're, uh, once you're running on Linux. And so, this is kind of a summary of a chart that we found where on the x-axis you'll have years over time and on the y-axis you have the number of CVEs or the number of security vulnerabilities reported. And the trend here is that this problem is not going away. If anything, this problem is getting slightly worse over time. So we have not solved this problem of security vulnerabilities of these memory and safety bugs in C and C++. 
And so clearly, this is when we start getting into the creation of Rust and kind of the motivation for Rust at this time. So the initial investors for Rust were Mozilla. Now, the primary product of Mozilla is Firefox. Firefox is a web browser, which obviously is intended to be one of the fastest web browsers that uh, is being developed today. But the downside of this is that Firefox is about 10 million lines of C++ code. <coughs> and for comparison, Chrome is about 12 million lines of C++ code. And naturally, this ends up being a pretty big problem for the security aspect. Every single one of these lines is candidate for being a security vulnerability or being a kind of a, any of those memory safety bugs we were talking about earlier. And to put this in numbers, the Firefox browser in 2016 had about 133 security vulnerabilities or CVEs reported against it. And for comparison, Chrome had about 230. Now, this isn't to say that Firefox is more secure than, than Chrome, but what it really means is that every single one of these 10 million lines of code can have this CVE lying in wait, can have these security bugs lying in wait. And we can evaluate the code base at any one point in time, but this doesn't account for the thousands of new lines written every single day that all have to be audited just as closely as every line of code that's already been sitting there for years at a time. And so I've been kind of conflating this memory safety vulnerability and security vulnerability, but this kind of really crisply puts it where an engineer at Mozilla, Robert Callahan, took an analysis of every bug related to every security bug related to web audio and found that 100% of them were all directly caused by a memory safety vulnerability. So I'm, I'm kind of using these terms interchangeably, and it's not true that every single CVE is a memory safety bug, but what it is tends to be true is that almost every memory safety bug <coughs> is a CVE. And in practice, this tends to be around 50 or, 50 or more percent of all security-related vulnerabilities are directly related to memory safety. And so clearly, this is when Rust starts to be created. This was about the time when, uh, in 2009, the kind of higher-ups in Mozilla were looking around looking for how do we solve this problem with Firefox? How do we just put, the, put an end to this problem once and for all? And about the same time in 2009, the original creator of Rust, Green Core, was working at Mozilla and started developing this language as sort of a pet project. So Mozilla started to uh, kind of put in full time on that, and kind of this was a very long bet to see whether this would pay off, and eventually start allowing us to kind of replace portions of Firefox with Rust, making it more safe and kind of eliminating this memory safety and security vulnerabilities we've been seeing. So in the early days, these were some of the original design requirements of Rust. First and foremost, always memory safety. The goal was to be a memory safe programming language to eliminate all of the security vulnerabilities and memory safety vulnerabilities. These next two, if you're familiar with Rust though, might seem a little odd. In the early days, Rust was also considered, uh, or thinking of having a thread local garbage collection, kind of thread local heaps. And the idea here was that Rust would uh, kind of solve the stop the world problem, where whenever you do garbage collection, every thread has to halt and the program makes no progress. The idea here was that every unit of isolation, every task, every thread would be able to stop, but everything else could continue making progress. Now along these lines, the intention was that this would be a green-threaded programming language, very similar to Go, if you're familiar with that. The downside with these aspects, though, is that both the thread local garbage collection and the idea of the green runtime ended up, they both have some hidden costs. They both, they don't necessarily allow you to run as close to the metal as you possibly can. So over time, we ended up finding that these last two requirements didn't really fit the design goals for Rust, or kind of where we felt that Rust was going. So over time, we changed this, and we ended up coming with this set of kind of the design requirements and kind of how we're developing Rust today. So first and foremost, we'll still find memory safety, the number one goal of Rust being a memory safe programming language. But just after that, we'll start to see that one of the uh, one of the requirements that we need to replace and unseat C and C++ is this ultimate level of performance. And this is where the kind of zero cost abstractions of Rust really come in. Mm -hmm. This must run as fast as possible with zero overhead from either the language or the runtime. And speaking of runtimes, instead of actually having garbage collection, we found a requirement was to not have garbage collection, to not have any runtime at all. This was very unique at the time because there was no memory safe language that did not have a runtime associated with it. And then finally, 
Uh, this means that we're basically falling back to traditional concurrency, this one-to-one -one concurrency. So not the end to end, not the green threading that you'll find in Go. But it led us to this key design problem of how do we actually do this in a world where there's not a lot of prior art? And it boils down to this question of how do we maintain memory safety in a concurrent program without a garbage collector? We'll find lots of program languages that certainly allow concurrency. We'll find lots of languages that allow for garbage collection. But finding this kind of union of type safety and data rate safety and the set while allowing concurrency was very difficult to find at the time. So to illustrate this problem, I'm going to show you a quick example. Here we have two threads with thread A on the left, thread B on the right. We have a stack on the, or a heap on the top and a stack on the bottom. So at some point, thread A will allocate this beautiful blue balloon. It puts the balloon on the stack, or on the heap. There's a kind of a cord, which means that there's a pointer on the stack pointing into the heap. And then what we're going to want to do is take this balloon and send it to thread B. So at that point, we'll just kind of copy it over, move it to B's heap, and we'll have this pointer on the stack still. But this was kind of a, so this, at a high level, this sometimes makes sense of how do we deal with this concurrent aspect. But when I said copy, there's a question of how do we actually implement this copy? We could do it like the Rust compiler did in the very early days by a deep copy of this balloon. But there might be pointers to other balloons or a stack pointer to this balloon. And that ended up being quite a problem. And so depending on how we deal with these various pointers and maybe we follow them, maybe we don't, we can easily run into situations that look like this where both thread A and thread B are contending for the same balloon, and this is essentially how a data race comes out. This is kind of uh, one, of a, one of the common vulnerabilities or kind of common bugs with a concurrent program that has some amount of shared memory. So this ends up boiling back to, well, now we need a global, a global garbage collector to kind of mitigate all of these problems. But this is about the time that uh, Nico Matsakis joined the rest of the time. And Nico was an honest to god type theorist who brought a lot of really cool ideas to Rust at the time. And two projects that we started looking at were Cyclone and Singularity. So Cyclone was a project, or a kind of a safe subset of C, kind of the static analysis to kind of try and make C a bit safer, have a somewhat of a different language at the time. But the idea was that it, was, it had a lot of aspects of the safety and memory safety, but it didn't quite handle the concurrency aspects. So, for that, we looked at this project called Singularity coming out of Microsoft Research. A singularity implemented a sort of unique system of ownership and kind of statically tracking the lifetime and values of pointers as they were moving across threads. So we ended up combining this and finding that kind of in a sense today, Rust is almost cyclone plus singularity kind of molded together. And by putting these together, we came up with these concepts of ownership and borrowing. These are the two foundational pillars for all safety in Rust today, and kind of how Rust as a language is completely built entirely around these. And to put these in words, in Rust, every value has a single, statically known, owning path in the code at any time. This is sort of the concept of ownership, where we precisely know where a resource is allocated, where it needs to be deallocated, and where it's being tracked in the program and kind of where it's currently located. But at the same time, pointers have a limited duration, this sort of lifetime aspect to them. And this is also static or trapped. So it's very important to understand that ownership and borrowing are purely a static analysis. There's no runtime associated with this. There's no, nothing happening at runtime. So this is all a zero cost pass in the compiler. And all of this is known statically at, at compile time. So these are incredibly important concepts to Rust. So I kind of want to dive into some examples here. Sometimes I have some balloons to play with on stage for this, but I, unfortunately I don't have that here. So instead, we, we'll take a look at stick boy on the left and stick girl on the right, and they're playing with balloons. So first up, I want to show you an example of moving an own value. I'll be showing a metaphor here, and we'll get to some code a little bit after this to kind of take a look at what's going on. So like before, stick boy has this beautiful blue balloon. He owns this balloon, which means he controls how this resource is allocated and where it goes. So over time, Stick girl might say, oh, can I have that balloon? And he can say, sure, I will transfer you to I will transfer to you this blue balloon. Now stick girl has ownership of this balloon and she can do whatever she wants with it. And the critical thing is that when stick boy wants this balloon back, he does not have ownership of this balloon. So he doesn't actually have control over whether he gets it back or not. But stick girl could give it back to him, or she could also 
let it go kind of pop in here. So this is the concept of ownership where every resource has one owner at any particular point in time, and they get to control what happens with that resource. The, se the second thing that I want to talk about is borrowing. Or, uh, sorry, uh, uh, is uh, borrowing. So in Rust, there are two kinds of borrows. The first of which is a shared reference. In this case, I'll be showing this with a green balloon as opposed to a blue balloon. And so in this case, we'll have uh, Stick Girl, when she wants this balloon, Stick Boy hands it to her, but still holds on to this string. So this is showing that Stick Boy is still the rightful owner of this balloon, but temporarily, Stick Girl can take a look at it, can inspect it, and has, has access to this balloon. But later on, when Stick Boy wants the balloon back, all he's got to do is tug on that string, and then allow him back it himself. So the shared borrow is unique where you do not take ownership of a resource. You're just kind of temper, temporarily looking at it for a particular lifetime. And crucially, <clears throat> there can be multiple shared borrows. So there's only one stick girl here, but you can imagine that the stick girl would then hand it off to others and we kind of follow, follow down a little bit. I'll show a little bit more of that a little bit later. So the second kind of borrow in Rust, and the last kind of thing I want to talk about, is a <coughs> mutable reference, as opposed to a shared reference we were just looking at. So in this case, with this red balloon, like before, Stick Girl wants access to it, and like with the shared borrow, Stick Boy still holds on to the string, he can still pull it back whenever he wants. But unlike a shared borrow, what Stick Girl can do is she can draw a beautiful smiley face. She can modify this balloon, she can mutate it, and then when Stick Boy pulls it back, he'll get it back, and now he can look at this beautiful smiley face, and he can do whatever he wants with this balloon as the owner, including popping. <laughs> Let's take a look at some code now, as opposed to just a metaphorical balloons flying all over the place. So this is an example of moving an own value in Rust. The first thing you notice is this main function, kind of the entry point of the program, will allocate a balloon on the stack, this variable b, variable b. We'll then call the examine balloon function, and we will transfer ownership. So the main function is transferring ownership of the balloon to the examine balloon function. Inside of the examine balloon, we can kind of take a look at it, print it out, we do whatever we want, and as the owner of the balloon, the examine balloon function will destroy this balloon when it goes out of scope. So when the examine balloon function returns, we'll deallocate whatever is associated with that balloon at that time. And so, as I was saying, this is a static analysis pass, which means that if we were to accidentally use the balloon back in the main function, we've already transferred ownership, and it's already been deallocated, so this would be a used after free, but the compiler will reject this code, saying that uh, this is a use after move, and you're not allowed to have access to, this, access to this object after ownership has been transferred. So the next example we took a look at was the shared reference. And the first thing we'll notice about shared references, as opposed to ownership, is this ampersand sigil. <clears throat> this is what denotes borrowing in Rust. So we have, we're passing in an ampersand b as opposed to just b, saying I'm giving you a borrow or a shared reference to this balloon. And then inside the examine balloon function, we have an ampersand balloon as opposed to just a balloon. And so like in the stick boy, stick girl example, we see that uh, both functions can print it out. Both functions can, both functions can read it, and main, as the owner of this balloon, will be the one that deallocates it once main returns. And the last thing that I was talking about was mutable references. So this is denoted by this ampersand mute, as opposed to just ampersand. So we'll notice that the balloon B in the stack is declared mutable, as opposed to just let, and then it'll pass in these ampersand mutes along the way. And this allows stick girl in the examine balloon function to draw a smiley face on it, to mutate this balloon. And then when we take a look at it in the main function, we'll see the smiley face, or we can see the result of it. So in summary, this is the concept of ownership and borrowing in Rust. The pillars of which all safety and kind of the rest of the language is built around at this point. It boils down to these three concepts of moving an own value, concept of ownership, these shared references, which we can have many of, and allow us to read and take a look at it, but don't allow us to mod modify our resources that much. We also have a mutable reference as, a, as, the last share, as the last kind of reference, which allows mutation, but only one. And so, an interesting thing about this is that you can only have either a shared reference or a mutable reference. These are kind of ex 
exclusive at compile time, and that allows us to control whether you're either reading or writing. And this is very similar to a, a read-write lock, if you've seen this in concurrent programs, where you know, a, a reader is sort of lots of shared references, or a writer with mutable references, but never both happening at the same time. All right, next up, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Rust is today. So this is kind of where we are, how far we have come with ownership and borrowing, and what the status of the project is as a whole, not necessarily the language, but also the community and support around it. So the first thing that we'll notice is that Rust truly is delivering on this best-in-class performance, this kind of in zero cost, lowest to the middle performance, competing with C and C++. You can look around at this with a few examples, the first of which is RipGrep. So RipGrep is by the author Andrew Gallant, and is meant to be a replacement for the grep utility on Linux. For those of you not familiar, this is a text searching, so given a body of text, trying to find a substring inside of it. And what you'll find is that this, which is almost entirely safe code, is almost eight times faster than the native grep utility. And depending on various benchmarks, it can be even faster or a little bit less. Like, the gap is a little bit smaller. But the key thing here is that Rust really is showing off that even if you write your program entirely safely, entirely within the safe subset of Rust, you never need to worry about these memory safety vulnerabilities, and you can get blazingly fast levels of performance, and unlike grep, you don't have to audit every single line of code for a vulnerability lying in wait. And so another example of this I like to talk about is a project called WebRender. So this is coming out of a, a, a web browser being written in Rust called Servo. And WebRender is sort of a novel new technique that how to actually render web pages and render scenes mostly on the GPU as opposed to kind of mostly on the software at that point. And this enables Servo to web render web pages at hundreds of frames per second, whereas browsers today struggle to get 10 to 15 frames per second. And this is all kind of a novel system built up in Rust, entirely orchestrated in Rust. At the same time, we don't have to worry about these vulnerabilities. We don't have to worry about all these kind of dangling frees, these dangling pointers. It's all taken care of. And we can, uh, this is actually one of the components that's currently being integrated into Firefox today. And you'll probably see, see soon in, I think, Firefox 57 later this November. Or so the next thing we'll notice about Rust is this concept of stability as a deliverable. This was a slogan of Rust kind of in the early days, where the idea is that stability is one of the most important aspects to Rust as a programming language today. Rust reached a stable 1.0 status back in 2015, and this was when, at that point in time, we were kind of done changing the language. We were no longer going to have breaking changes, we're no longer to, we're going to guarantee source level stability. And this is incredibly important for building up a very large community around Rust because you can't just pull the rug out of everyone every few weeks. But since then, we've had 19 point releases, where the theme for every single one is that if you compile on the previous point release, you will continue compiling on future point releases. And this has served kind of a light ownership and borrowing, a rock solid foundation for the entire community, <coughs> community to be growing on and to be building up new, more new projects on. And you'll find that this uh, kind of focus on stability, this focus on not breaking code, it also leaks out into the rest of the ecosystem. It's not just the Rust compiler and the Rust language and the Rust project, but also all the libraries throughout the Rust ecosystem tend to follow the same sort of standards where a very strong focus is given to stability and not breaking code over time. The next thing we'll notice in Rust is this library ecosystem associated with it. So, at 1.0, Rust was released with a package manager called Cargo. And this was kind of one of the most crucial features of Rust at 1.0, allowing you to very easily share code and move code between repositories. This is all published to a site called crates.io, which is very similar to npmjs.org or rubygems.org, if you're familiar with that. And on crates.io, we have just over 10,000 crates, we have 50 to 60,000 versions, and we have almost 200 million downloads uh, from just Trace.io. And this has proved to be an excellent catalyst for growing the Rust community. The standard library itself in Rust is relatively small, it's relatively conservative, and this was done intentionally to allow a lot of experimentation, a lot of kind of growth in the ecosystem externally on Trace.io in a third-party fashion. And this is sort of crucial for operating in Rust in the sense that it's 
very easy to pull in others' code. It's very easy to publish your own code. It's very easy to kind of put libraries together and get a real-world application with hundreds of dependencies up and running very quickly. The next thing we'll notice about Rust is something that you don't necessarily always hear about when you hear about programming languages, but it's Rust's community. Rust has one of the most vibrant and helpful and kind of most welcoming communities I've ever seen personally. And this is made up of over 2,000 contributors to just the Rustlang Rust project. That's kind of the standard library and the compiler. This 2,000 contributors isn't even counting contributors to Cargo, the package manager, Crates.io, the website, or the various, uh, all the crates on Crates.io building and kind of building an ecosystem on there. You'll also find there's a number of conferences happening about Rust. So we have RustConf, which is actually happening in a few weeks in Portland. We have Rust Fest happening about a month, uh, a month from now in Zurich. And we have Rust Belt Rust also happening in the US in Columbus, Ohio in a month or so. And this is kind of a great place to kind of meet the Rust community, see them all in person, and really experience what it means to kind of be in the, be in the Rust community with a first-hand experience. So that's kind of a, a few statistics and kind of a few things about from us about how Rust is today. But I want to show you some examples of what others are saying about Rust as well. So this is an example from the Stack Overflow 2017 survey, where the, you were asked the question, what language are you currently using, and would you like to continue using it or not? So if you would like to continue using the language that you're currently using, it's kind of deemed a loved language. And for the second year in a row, Rust has come out as the most loved language on the survey. And what this is really showing is that if, you, if you're working in Rust, it's kind of we see, you know, we see the sentiment that a lot of times it kind of reinvigorates people and kind of re-energizes people to be interested in programming again. Rust ends up being a very nice language to work in. Built in kind of the modern era, Rust doesn't have all this baggage from decades ago. And it kind of is a nice clean slate to start afresh with all these modern practices. So not just these concrete things of ownership and borrowing, but also nice language features like pattern matching. A great uh, community builder like Cargo to kind of easily share code. All of this kind of builds up into a really nice experience, which makes Rust a very nice language, and you tend to not want to move away from it. And it's not just Stack Overflow sorry, saying this as well. This is from the Red Knot Programming Languages Programming Language Rankings, saying that Rust went from the 46th most popular language to the 18th most popular language on GitHub, where no other language has grown faster than Rust. And this is kind of a great way of uh, saying that today we're starting to hit that exponential growth in Rust, kind of that up and to the right curve. And this is the point where we start seeing a real uh, exponential growth in Rust's adoption and how Rust is being used throughout the community and kind of the growth of Rust in general. And this is also really well embodied from our, our friends page. So this is a link on our website where you'll see a list of every company using Rust in production. And the first thing you'll notice about if, if you go to this web, web page is the overwhelming number of companies that are using Rust in production. So this is kind of a great embodiment of how Rust from day one was production focused. We were always developing Rust initially for being used in a web browser, but more generally to be used in a real world and practical application. So you'll see all, all, all of these companies are kind of initially capitalizing on this. And we see new companies coming into this page every week. And one of the great ways that I like to sum all this up is this concept of fearlessness. This, this was originally coined with, with the term fearless concurrency in Rust, where you no longer have to worry about your concurrent programs. You don't have to worry about data races. You don't have to worry about kind of orchestrating all this together as it simply falls out once your program compiles. But this concept of fearlessness transfers to much more than just concurrency. We have this Fearless in terms of stability. You don't have to worry about everything breaking. Not only the compiler and the language, but because this is bled out to the community as well, you don't have to worry about basically anything breaking your code at that point. With, with Cargo and Crates.io, you can kind of fearlessly pull in external dependencies. You don't have this normal arcane or archaic hassle that comes with C and C++ trying to pick up any dependency ever. And this, also this concept of you can run Rust in production. Fearlessly, you don't have to, once you deploy it, you don't have to worry about these site faults, these crashes, these weird things that are very difficult to debug. All of this is kind of mean that once your, once your Rust program compiles, it's probably going to work. 
And so all this kind of contributes to the concept of this kind of sentiment of fearless programming, this kind of fearlessly working in Rust and getting, getting more productive at what you're doing as opposed to trying to worry about all these low-level details. So all right, the last thing I want to talk about is the future of Rust, kind of some challenges that we're facing and some upcoming features that are coming down the pipe. So the first thing you'll notice is that there's a few challenges for Rust. Everything is not perfect in Rust, and so we have uh, a lot of stuff to be, to be working on as well. Rust as a relatively new language and kind of unique language as well. These concepts of ownership and borrowing are probably, Rust is probably the first language to bring them to relatively mainstream programming. So as a result, these can have kind of a high learning, high learning curve, kind of very difficult to kind of internalize when you first start working on Rust. This is something that we've been working very, very hard to kind of lower, we want to have the lowest learning curve and kind of remove all these obstacles, these easy, these small things that tr trick you up early on. So the goal is to kind of make it as easy as possible to get into Rust once you start working on it. And also, Rust sees a lot of competition from other languages. So Rust is probably one of the only ones that fills its niche of C and C++ level of performance, the runtime, while also being safe. But for any other particular aspect, kind of running on a web server, running on a microcontroller, running on a desktop, desktop app, there's a lot of competition for any, any one particular language. And so we, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of smoothing this over the experience with integration, the experience with kind of working into other game systems and such like that. And so I want to talk specifically about replacing uh, the competition from C and C++. First up, some challenges with replacing C++. The first thing we'll notice here is that there's a lot of C++ code already, already written today. And if you want to start writing your code in Rust instead, you're probably not going to rewrite your entire code base all in one night. It's probably going to be done in a very piecemeal fashion, where you write just one module in Rust, and then slowly and slowly that grows as you delete C++ and add some more Rust code. But what this means is that your, your new Rust code is going to have to work with your old C++ code this kind of C++ language interop. It's very, very common in Pat. Comes up with almost every production user in Rust working with C++. And the interop story is not great today. There's a lot of kind of manual things you have to do to actually get this working, and it can be relatively error prone, which kind of erodes some of the safety guarantees you'll have in Rust because you're, you're crossing with this language boundary. So kind of C++ language interop, and otherwise more generally, language interoperation between Rust and other languages is something that we need to work a lot on and kind of is a challenge for us to overcome. And then along these lines, there's also kind of the more mundane aspects of just a build system integration. So we have all the C++ code, and we have this new Rust code, and all I want to do is build it, assemble it, and link it into the same program. That's sometimes not a very trivial task to do. It can be very, very complicated with these various arcane and bespoke build systems in C and C++ that can be difficult to integrate into. So both of these are something that we've been working a lot on in 2017 to kind of lower this barrier to entry, but we still, we still have a lot of extra work to be going along here. And the next up, and lastly, I want to talk about the challenges for replacing C. So Rust guarantees what I was saying, source level stability, but it does not guarantee binary level stability, where different compilers over time will have different ABIs, different binary level kind of interfaces of what's going on there. This is unlike C, which by default has a stable interface at the binary level in addition to the source level. So this is something where you can do it in Rust, but it's very uh, cumbersome, it's very difficult to do, it can be very error prone, and so making that kind of a first class citizen in Rust and making it very easy to do so is a, a big challenge for us. Also along the lines of C is this technique called monomorphization. So this is a fancy word for saying how Rust implements generic programming where Rust will instantiate, where whenever you instantiate a function, sort of like adding, adding a list of strings or adding a list of numbers, Rust will create a new copy of that function every time you call that. But that means that you can have some level of code load. You can kind of have lots of copies of a function that are all subtly different. Whereas opposed to C, a lot of this tends to be done virtually, so kind of idiomatic Rust might be a little more code heavy than idiomatic C, where once you start writing the same kind of constraints of your existing C program, the Rust code might not look so idiomatic, might be a little more difficult to write that time. And then finally, 
there's this unstructured control flow in C, this go to, this set jump, this long jump. These do not map well to Rust's concepts of ownership and borrowing. And kind of, it's very difficult to bolt safety onto these things. So if you have a C program that very heavily relies on these aspects, then it, it can be very difficult to translate that into Rust. <coughs> so despite all that, we are definitely still very much of the belief that Rust will succeed. And I want to give you some reasons to kind of talk about a couple of things about why we think that despite these challenges, Rust is set up for nothing but success at this point. The first of which you'll notice is this incredible base of technology which Rust is found, founded on. These are the concepts of ownership and borrowing, the zero cost abstractions, these, these core design principles in Rust are, are a rock solid foundation to build up the rest of the language, the rest of the community around at this point. So we're, we're never compromising on speed, we're always having this static analysis at compile time, which helps solve a huge number of bugs, not just related to memory safety. And all of this aspect kind of really boils down to the point that we have a really solid technological and technical foundation for Rust to be built on. And I was talking about how Rust is very production focused, and this is something that has been crucial to Rust's success so far. Being production focused from day one, has kind of guided a lot of our decisions along the way, saying, well, this could work out, but it might take many, many years to actually get this to come to fruition. So instead, we need to find a path in the middle of the meantime, which actually allows us to move forward, but still leaves us open to the fact that we can implement this new feature in the future. So having that focus has been really helped us kind of uh, Stay on, stay on schedule, make sure we don't delay anything too much, and make sure that we actually get Rust 2A 1.0 and production status on a reasonable timeline. The next thing we'll see is that Rust has a very strong and flexible ecosystem design. I was saying earlier that the Rust <coughs> standard library is actually very small, it's very conservative. This is very different if you come from a language like Python, where you expect all these various utilities to be there, but they're not there in Rust. And the way this actually ends up working out in Rust is that, despite this, you have such easy access to Chris.io, you effectively have access to all the same utilities. But the benefit of this, this approach is the ability for very easy and rapid iteration inside the ecosystem. So changing the standard library is very difficult, but changing a create on Chris.io is very easy to do and can allow for competing implementations, can allow for evolving implementations, and kind of can get us much more quickly to a fixed point of exactly what we, what, what we would like and how we would like to implement it much more quickly. Uh, kind of the other aspect of this that I want to talk about is that uh, the language itself is very conservative here. So you'll find that the Rust programming language, the Rust compiler, knows nothing about concurrency. All the compiler knows about is these concepts of ownership and borrowing. And on top of this, we're able to build a toolkit of utilities in the standard library to help you work with concurrency. So all we're doing is we're using these relatively simple language concepts and then building up a very large set of utilities inside of libraries. And this is another case where, like I was saying, it's much easier to change crates like crates.io than it is to change the standard library. It's much easier to add utilities to the standard library and change the implementation than to change the language. So having this kind of very small and flexible core of a language that we can build on in the standard library and build on in the ecosystem has been absolutely crucial to Rust's success so far and is why it ends up being so flexible and so useful to such a wide variety of use cases. And so finally, some reasons that I think Rust will succeed. One of the primary things it's doing is expanding the audience of systems programmers. So this is where this concept of a systems programmer has tended, tended to be historically a very narrow or kind of uh, architect or, uh, is a archetypal concept where kind of there's a one thing you think of when you think of a systems programmer. It's this grizzled wizard which has been working for years to get working code in C and C++. But what Rust is enabling us to do is taking these programmers from Ruby and Python and JavaScript that would otherwise be intimidated by the how much you need to know in C and C++ and say, you can work at that level inside of Rust and have that level of fearlessness, that level of you no longer have to worry about all the same problems you would otherwise, and you can still be just as productive as you are in Ruby and Python, JavaScript and all that. And a lot of this is 
powered by this very strong culture around Rust as well. This kind of uh, the, the the community from day one has been very welcoming, very supportive, very kind of inclusive, and kind of this is essentially changing the de facto culture we find in systems programming. The average C C programmer tends to be very, very different from the average Rust programmer in a lot of positive ways. All right, so to give you an idea of what's coming up in Rust. This is kind of why we think Rust will succeed, but here's some features that are coming down the pipe. A lot of this is kind of going off the 2017 roadmap. This is something that we publish every year in terms of what we would like to do over the next year and kind of upcoming features. The first thing you'll notice is this idea of improved ergonomics. So one of the biggest challenges for Rust has been this learning curve, kind of these small hiccups you'll find when you first start learning Rust. And so a lot of what we have been working on is improving this kind of first experience, improving this kind of first impression of Rust to make sure that you get as quickly as possible to an understanding of Rust so you can start being as productive as you normally are. We'll also find this library called Tokyo. This is kind of the exploration of asynchronous I.O. and Rust, this concept of futures, this concept of highly scalable event-driven servers. Rust at 1.0 did not have a great solution for this, and this has kind of been in development for quite some time now. And we're really starting to see Tokyo and the surrounding ecosystem take off this year in terms of empowering Rust to scale up to these really, really high performance servers. We'll also see a lot of uh, rewritten documentation this year. So along the lines of lowering this learning curve and making Rust easier to enter, we've completely rewritten the introductory, the introductory book to the Rust programming language as an entirely new second edition. This is already showing off a lot of different benefits a lot of benefits are kind of much more easy to understand, much more easy to kind of bring you on board with the language, and we should see this published a little bit later this year. Next up, we'll see a lot of improvements in tooling. This is something very common we see in uh, production users requesting this, which is a lot of IDE support, this uh, go-to definition, this auto-completion, this filling out what methods do I have. This tooling can often be critical to the productivity of programmers at these large corporations. So we've been working on this project called the RLS, the Rust Language Server, which kind of is a tool to integrate into other IDEs and support all these queries that you would expect, and kind of give you this native level of support for all the common things like go-to definition and all that. And then finally, as I was saying earlier, we're working a lot this year on improving language in our operations. Not just with C++, but also with languages like JavaScript and Ruby, Python, and all that. And the idea here is that Rust is not going to take over the world overnight. It's going to be a very slow and kind of gradual uptake over time. And the way we're going to be doing that is by interoperation with existing languages. So that's kind of what we are doing to enable Rust developers and to kind of empower the Rust language to move forward. But the real thing that's going to actually make Rust succeed at this point is going to be programmers like you, writing the next generation of programs written in Rust and enjoying the competitive, competitive advantage that Rust gives you over languages like C and C++. The legacy of C and C++ will continue for decades to come, but the future is in safety, and the future is written in Rust. Once again, my name is Alex Graydon, and this was the end of Unsafety. Thank you for coming.
So the idea of that all of this unsafety tends to be encapsulated in these safe interfaces. And most conventional libraries, kind of most applications, they very, very rarely need to lower down and actually use these unsafe pieces. So the critical things here are that by default, everything is safe. By default, you're not using unsafe, which means that the amount of unsafe code that you have to audit tends to be very, very small. And then furthermore, most of the unsafe code tends to be used from, ex from external libraries, from the ecosystem. And that means that most of the time it's going to be very well vetted by other external authors, by tons of other different use cases. And the final thing here is that uh, we're working a lot right now in kind of developing these unsafe code guidelines. And the idea here is that we're actually writing an interpreter to where you can feed it unsafe code and it will say that this is unsafe code. And, that, and this is precisely what can go wrong at this point. And then that's, like, it will give you a, a search and check at one time saying you need to go fix this, this is the memory. So it is true, this is a weakness in Rust safety and guarantee, guarantee having unsafe at all, but kind of in practice this ends up being such a small portion of Rust code, it tends up being a very well vetted portion of Rust code, it tends to not be a problem in kind of the same way you would see CVEs and memory safety vulnerabilities and C and C++. Does that make sense? This interface that I've long said you got that you just mentioned, is this supposed to be a hint for the programmer? Right, so that was a question about, is this just a hint for the programmer? No, actually what this is doing is, I didn't talk much about this in the talk, but uh, Rust, you can have an unsafe block, where you say unsafe and then a block of code. And what that's actually enabling you to do is it's kind of giving you more powers. It doesn't turn off any static analysis, so borrowing and ownership still works inside there, but you can do things like dereference raw pointers or call unsafe methods. And so it's kind of giving you the ability to do more than you would be able to do otherwise. And that allows you to kind of go to the raw level of things and work, work with lots of other stuff. But it, so it's not just a, a user annotation, but rather it's literally enabling you to do things where if you try and do it in safe Rust, you're, it's, you get a compiler error, and in unsafe Rust, you're allowed to do it. Uh, as you mentioned, that uh, Rust doesn't have something like uh, long jump or safe jump, and I, I'm wondering if Rust can replace a uh, low-level system programming in like uh, C language, or does Rust intend it to do so? Yes, definitely. Replacing C kind of these code bases that we showed you at the beginning, OpenSSL, curl, GPC, all these core libraries written in C. They have all these memory safety problems, and this has kind of been plaguing us for decades at this point. So Rust is very much intended at replacing C and kind of whatever you would be using C for nowadays, Rust should be more than sufficient for that. So if you kind of start today with a new project, you tend, especially if you started in Rust, you tend to not need these concepts of set jump and long jump. The, the common problems that it solves in C are kind of solved in other mechanisms in Rust. Now, there are slightly different trade-offs in terms of things, but it's essentially, if you have an existing code base using set jump and long jump, I think like uh, libpng is one that uses this almost everywhere, then it's very difficult to directly translate that to Rust. But sort of new code bases with like slightly, slightly new paradigms that you can, can be very easily translated from C to Rust, or maybe you can have a Rust library that looks like it's in C. Yes? Could you share a call? Developing a web service with Rust. Right. The question was about developing a web service with Rust. So this is something that uh, has definitely been under development for quite some time, and unfortunately, we never had a great story for it in the sense. But a lot of focus of 20, one of the roadmap goals for 2017 was to enable Rust to be useful for, and productive for this precise use case of writing a web service. So a lot of this has been going into the, into the efforts of. So we have Tokyo which is primarily, allowing you, primarily enabling you to write a very high-scale web service. So a lot of times, most companies don't necessarily need that level of scalability or that level of performance. So we're also working a lot on, uh, very recently we re released an HTTP crate, which is kind of the core types for HTTP functionality. And then we, we envisioned building on top of that a relatively simple but still functional and featureful implementation of a single threaded server kind of writing those kinds of frameworks. And there's, there's a lot of frameworks today. There's things called like Iron and Nickel and Rocket, various crates in the Rust ecosystem that are kind of enabling you to write a web service relatively easily. But 
Unfortunately, it's not quite the same smooth experience you would experience in uh, Node.js or Python. It tends to be a little more manual right now, and it's definitely something that we're working on a lot. Is there a debugger for Rust that we can set prep form? Excellent question. Uh, question about is there a debugger for Rust? And the answer is yes, there's GDB. And <laughs> actually just falls out in the sense that Rust has the same compilation model of C and C++, and it's a massive advantage to be able to use GDB. So there's GDB on Linux, there's LLDB on OSX, there's the Visual Studio debugger on Windows. All of these native debuggers which work for C and C++ work seamlessly for Rust. You'll find that uh, profiling Rust is the same way, debugging Rust is the same way, and this enables us to, we didn't have to go out of our way to build a new debugger, but we're able to capitalize on existing very good debuggers and just work with them. All right, thank you so much for coming. And stick around, this is more Rust coming. Thank you.